CNN's John Avlon recently released a segment for his reality check series titled The Surprising Common Psychological Traits Between the Far Left and the Far Right. Now, the segment itself is fairly long, but unfortunately, I suffered through its entirety, so we're not going to get into all of it, but primarily, I do want to look at particular portions of this where he draws or tries to draw direct comparisons between the far left and the far right, because as you're going to see, he is grasping at straws. And the reason why it looks really silly when you try to compare the far left in America to the far right in America is because these sides are not similar. One side wants to give every single American health care, and the other side wants to install Donald Trump as a permanent dictator and enact a white ethno state. So to draw these comparisons, it's it's stupid. I mean, to both sides, this for purposes of neutrality, that's bad because if you think that the far right is indeed a threat and they do state why the far right is an issue, well, then you're tacitly normalizing them by comparing them to people on the left. Now, uh, you know, it doesn't just focus on the psychological similarities because I could understand how maybe if you take a really hard line stance politically and you're hyper engaged in politics, sure, there might be some similarities psychologically across the political spectrum. Who knows? But that's not really what they do. And the issues that they bring up with respect to the left are laughable. But first, let's get to the portion uh, that a lot of people saw on Twitter where uh, he directly compares the far left prejudices to the far right prejudices. Shout out to Emo Dragon on Twitter. Without this person, I would not have been able to find this full clip. Uh, so thank you for that. Without further ado, let's watch. A recent study out of Cambridge University found that mental rigidity is tied to intense political partisanship on the left and right. Another study out of the Netherlands broke down the common characteristics in the psychological features of people who gravitate towards extreme ideologies on the right and the left. They found four broad underlying psychological features. A sense of distress about society. An overly simplistic black or white perception of the world. A consequent overconfidence in their own judgments and beliefs, which translates to an intolerance for different groups based on those prejudicial assumptions. For example, they found that Social categories subject to right-wing prejudice include ethnic minorities, gays and lesbians and feminists, while social categories subject to left-wing prejudice include Christians, business people, and the military. For both the left and right, they say, such prejudice is attributable to an ideological conflict that's based on the assumption that people with a different social identity also have different ideological beliefs. In other words, People with politically extreme beliefs tend to downgrade the humanity and individuality of people with whom they perceive they'll disagree. This is the essence of prejudice and illiberalism, and it can lead to some very dangerous things. So I feel like I shouldn't have to really break this down too much because I think that you can see pretty easily why that is laughable. Now, just to get to the first study that he cited there about mental rigidity between extreme left and right. I mean, honestly, that makes sense to me. I don't really view that as an insult. And it makes sense because if one side really, really, really wants a white ethno state, then I think it's natural that the other side will be equally rigid and not want an ethno state. So, you know, if somebody wants to hurt you, then sure, on the opposite side, that's going to create a lot of feelings of not wanting to be hurt. So the mental rigidity thing and the psychological differences here, that doesn't really mean much to me with regard to, you know, similarities. We're all human beings and there is going to be a reaction to every action. So it doesn't really matter to me. But where it gets downright idiotic is when he talks about the prejudices. So when it comes to the uh, right-wing prejudices, uh, that includes ethnic minorities, gays, lesbians, and feminists. Now, I'm not sure why the study had feminists um, instead of women, but put women in that category instead of feminists. I mean, they hate feminists, but they also hate women as well. Just last week, Nick Fuentes, a far-right individual, was talking about how he believes that women should have as much rights as the Taliban allows them to have. So uh, it's not just feminism that the far-right is against. It's, it's women, period.
period. I mean, in Texas, they just passed a law this year banning abortion effectively. So I, I don't know why they use that. But here's where it gets comical. So on the left, the prejudices that we have includes Christians, business people, and the military. Now, notice how these two groups are entirely different categories of people. So the right is prejudiced against people based on immutable characteristics, whereas the left is, quote, prejudiced against the drivers of injustice. I mean, business elites, they drive income and wealth inequality, which creates unjust economic conditions for working people, whereas the military isn't used defensively. It's a hyper-capitalist murder machine that's wreaking havoc on the globe. And when it comes to Christians, I mean, to say that left-wingers are prejudiced against Christians is idiotic because we all have Christians in our family, and there's no institutional power that the left is using to crack down on Christian rights. In fact, their political and institutional influence has only grown over the years. So the dispute that they're seeing is the politicization of Christianity, the rise of evangelicals. And because evangelicals and, you know, Christianity is something that Republicans are trying to legislate, you know, they, they are targeting people who have no power, marginalized groups, LGBTQ plus people and whatnot. But, you know, they, they view fighting injustice and being prejudiced against marginalized minorities as virtually indistinguishable. It, it's truly a brain dead segment. Now, uh, he's going to bring on Jonathan Hyde, who's an expert. He's a social uh, psychologist, and he's going to explain to us specifically why the left is you know, basically a mirror image of the far right, how authoritarian we have become. And ironically, by describing the left in the way that he's going to, as you're about to see, he's going to play right into the far right's narrative. I want to say, you know, you're a self-described centrist and liberal, but you've been very concerned about the rise of illiberal ideas on the left, saying that you see this as creating a mirror image of conservative populism on the right. Explain. Yes. So first, let me just say I'm a liberal, not because I'm on the left. I'm not on the left anymore. I'm a liberal because I believe that the only solution to living together with diversity that has ever been found that works is the liberal tradition in which we try to grant each other maximum freedom to live together and create lives that we want to live. Um, now, traditionally, as we were just saying, we found that, oh, these rigid people, these people threatened by diversity, they're all on the right. That's the problem, right-wing authoritarianism. And that is pretty visible. And especially in the last five or seven years, we're seeing a rise of right-wing populism that has authoritarian elements around the world. But here's another interesting twist in recent social psychological research. People have been looking for left-wing authoritarianism for a long time. Some have called it the Loch Ness Monster of political psychology. Um, but in recent years, it's become a lot more visible. The left has been getting more authoritarian. Um, there's interesting research showing that in 2015, there was what we now call the Great Awakening. Something happened to white people on the left. They become much more strident. They moved much further to the left. And they became, in some ways, much more illiberal, more focused on telling people, here's what you can't say. Here's what you must say. So it's a really interesting time to be studying political psychology, and it's changing fast. Really? So your evidence of left-wing authoritarians is essentially SJWs? I just, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> now, he's talking about this as if it's some sort of a new phenomenon, right? But you see, the rise of SJWs isn't so much of a rise. It's just that, you know, it's being politicized more. People on college campuses protesting certain speakers, individuals, you know, being politically correct. This isn't a new thing. This isn't some new thing. They're literally trying to shoehorn SJWs into this conversation just so they can appear neutral, just so they can say, well, yeah, we're attacking the far right, but we're also attacking the far left. And they even tacitly admit that, you know, th this isn't really an issue. There's not a lot of extremism on the left. Uh, he called it a Loch Ness monster of political psychology for quite some time. I wonder why. It's because it's the right who is radicalizing in this country. To the extent that the far left exists, I don't think it, it's that common. Now, I personally, I will admit that I have moved to the left over the last couple of years. I used to be a social democrat, and now I'm explicitly anti-capitalist. But that's because I am a product of my generation. Capitalism has failed millennials and Gen Zers. So, of course, 
I think it's natural to not like the system that has kind of fucked you over, created this environment where you don't know whether or not the planet will be habitable for future generations or when you're older. So, you know, I don't necessarily think that that is far left, right? I think that being a socialist, advocating for universal healthcare of some sort, I don't think that that makes you far left. I think that what makes you far left is if maybe you are overly authoritarian in the sense that, you know, you support policies like the Chinese government cracking down on free speech, banning criticism of the government and whatnot. I think that leftists like that, perhaps they exist, but what are there, like 12 in the United States? Is that really a big issue? Is there really a need to compare the far left, the 12 people like that are deeply, explicitly authoritarian to the rest of the far right, which is a growing phenomenon that literally threatens democracy? Is that really important to compare these two? And he kind of uh, subtly plays into the Bernie bro trope. He says, you know, in 2015, there was what we call the gr the Great Awakening. Something happened to white people. Now, he's hinting at Bernie Sanders, right? Because I, I do think that it's fair to say, yeah, 2015, something did happen. You know, it was kind of like a political wake-up call where we realized how broken the system was because Bernie Sanders had... Uh, you know, made everyone aware of the flaws in our system like no other politician has in the past. But he makes it seem as though, oh, it's just these white Bernie bros. But then the actual example that he gives is SJWs. Well, if you look at Bernie bros, first and foremost, it's not just white people. Second of all, uh, they are advocating for worker rights, universal health care, you know, uh, education that's free, student debt cancellation. So where's the authoritarianism that you're speaking of? He cites these SJW examples and it's just, it's not, it's not convincing. It's not persuasive enough. Now, John Ablon said that the far left is quote, creating a mirror image of conservative populism on the right. Is that so? You really believe that, John? You really believe that the far left, the woke SJWs on college campuses is creating a mirror image of conservative populism on the right? You honestly believe that? Okay, well then be honest. In the event you had to choose one, the far left in America or the far right, who would you prefer to be in power? Ask any centrist this who tries to equate or, or conflate rather the far left with the far right. Ask them, who'd you prefer to be in control? The group of people that desperately want to give everyone health care and education or the group of people that want a white ethno state with Donald Trump as a permanent dictator? Ask them. If they're being honest, they're going to tell you, well, of course, I prefer the people who want to give everyone health care. And they'll say that because they know one side is fucking bonkers and one side is actually compassionate. One side might be viewed as extreme because we are very vocal, but it's because we care about fighting injustice. The prejudices that the far left has stems from the fact that certain groups, elites, the business interests, they're hurting workers. Christians in power are hurting marginalized people by pushing anti-gay policies. We are trying to fight injustice. That's what we care about. And Jonathan Haidt talked about how, you know, I think that the best solution is to have this liberal society. That's what the far left is supporting, idiot. The far right does not support that. And what he doesn't realize is that if you truly want to live in a liberal society, you must not tolerate intolerance. There's a really popular graphic by Karl Popper that a lot of people will share whenever this comes up, whenever there's this idea that we should work with the far right or collaborate with them or maybe normalize them. You cannot allow this to happen. If you become so tolerant that you normalize and elevate fascists into positions of power who are against free speech and marginalized communities, then we let them use our freedom against us and we lose freedom as a result. Liberal society's survival hinges on fascism's demise. So pushing back on increasing fascism isn't in itself authoritarianism, right? I, I think that it is the case that you can say maybe sometimes kids on college campuses, they get a little bit too censorious and they don't allow certain speakers to come. And maybe some of those speakers should be allowed to speak. But if you are suggesting that there's an equivalence here just so you can appear neutral then you are doing the far right's bidding for them. So as dangerous as you think they are, perhaps maybe you shouldn't play into their memes and their lies about the far left because it's it's not right. And this segment from CNN is dangerous. This is why, you know, neutrality media is just bad because some things just 
don't require neutrality. There aren't two equal sides to every single political issue. And the far left is nothing like the far right. And shame on these two folks for uh, pushing that narrative. I'm going to come. Do not come. 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 Come, 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 come.